uh, I believe you indicated that the Higginham, Connecticut site was right on Route 9, correct? It is, yes. And was that continuing to head? <coughs> Let's strike that. This now, does that indicate something about uh, your customer 4304? Uh, this site is, is now south of the site we just, of site 115 that we just talked about. Indicating that uh, in that time between those two calls, one at 13 minutes past midnight, and now at 28 past midnight on June 18th, the vehicle has turned back in the direction it had been coming. Is that correct? It does look that way, yes. Next uh, cell phone call. Do you see that? I do. Where, uh, can you tell us what uh, location that is, please? Uh, that's served by, the start of the call is served by site 156. And um, where's, uh, you're familiar with uh, site 156? I am, yes. And where's cell site 156? It is located in Saybrook, Connecticut, at the address of 226 Ferry Road. And I'm going to show you that uh, cell site. Do you recognize uh, the, the location there? I do, yes. We're, and uh, what's depicted there? Uh, it's actually a very tall power line, and we're, we're located on that power line. Crosses the river. Can you point that out, please, in the photograph? Uh, we are actually just below the power line, right in this area here. In this area here, is that correct? A little higher, right there, those antenna. These uh, antenna? Yep, that's right. And in relationship to uh, the highway, where is that location? That's along 95. And um, now back coming on 95 from the direction of Route 9, is that correct? Yes. So you would, to get from, are you asking me how you get from Higginham to there? Yes. Okay, so you would have to head south on Route 9 to get back to 95. And you indicated that that started at that tower and it ended elsewhere, is that true? It, it did end. And where did it end, please? I've lost the ruler, but yeah. Uh, yeah, site 183, which is uh, located at 30 Short Hills Road in Old Lyme, Connecticut. You recognize that? Yes, that's the site. And uh, that's at, uh, in Lyme, Connecticut, right along Route 95 <coughs> is indicated there, is that correct? Yes. And if I just, do you see wh which cell tower there is yours? <coughs> you can't see it. Uh, well, but we are the northbound site. This one here casting the shadow? Yes. <clears throat> now, that was... This series of calls here, right? The 40 and 43 after midnight calls, is that correct? That, that's right, yes. And the next call on the record, does that indicate uh, that it inbound call? Yes. And uh, from whom is that call? Uh, that's coming in from phone number 860-502-2593. And to your customer, uh, 4304, is that correct? Yes. And uh, what uh, tower is used to connect your customer to the network there? Cell 273. And you went to that site, is that correct? I did, yes. And I showed you that uh, photograph. you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What's depicted in that photograph? So, so that's our cell site dead center of the, of the picture. Is that it there? Yes. And where is that located in relationship to the highway, please? Uh, that is actually along 95. I believe it's physically south of 95. And it, it, does that indicate a direction that the the vehicle? The Check to the, the reference I, of the vehicle. I, I don't draw that part. Your customer cell phone 4304 is A. Um, eastbound. Along or 95, uh, 95 north, it would be an eastbound direction along the coast. Next. Um, <clears throat> Paul, do you see that there? I do. And that occurs at uh, just a few seconds after one, is that correct? Yes. And um, that uh, is a connection with what tower, please? Uh, 
292. And did you visit uh, Tower 292, please? I did. Can I show you that photograph? Do you recognize that photograph? Yes. And what is that photograph, please? That's uh, our antenna located on the smokestack. <clears throat> and is that located there? Yes. And uh, where is that uh, uh, cell site in relationship to uh, Route 95, please? Uh, also along 95. And that particular call, that incoming call, correct? Yes. Uh, could you tell us the, the uh, telephone number that was used to place that particular call? 617-930-1341. Uh, and now, <clears throat> The next call, do you recognize that call? Yes. And uh, that call uh, begins uh, approximately 40 seconds later, is that correct? Yes. And uh, the call up above it there, did that indicate that that call was routed to some place in the uh, Sprint network? Uh, yeah, that's a voicemail call. And this very next call, does that also indicate that it's routed to some place in the Sprint network? Yes, at 101 and 16 seconds, yes. It's a routed, it's a voicemail call. And that comes from the same telephone number, 617-930-1341, correct? Yes. And uh, when that call comes in, what uh, cell tower is, is used to connect your customer's phone, 4304, to the network, please? 292. Same uh, cell site, is that correct? Yes. And uh, this very next... Um, call, that's an outgoing call, is that correct? Yes. And uh, your customer's uh, cell phone, 4304, calls the number 2593, is that correct? Correct, yes. And uh, at what time does that take place? Uh, 101 and 51 seconds. And uh, can you tell us please uh, what cell site is used to connect your customer's uh, cell phone to the network, please? Uh, cell site 293. Uh, you've been to that location as well, is that correct? I have, yes. And I'm showing you this photograph. you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What's depicted in that photograph, please? So this is, this is our, our site here on the left of the picture. Here, is that correct? Yes. And uh, where is that lo uh, cell site location in, in relationship to uh, Route 95, please? It's uh, along 95 uh, to the north of 95. And in relationship to... Um, Cell site 292, which you were just describing, where is that? 292? Um, the one that was immediately preceding this. Uh, also, also along 95. And um, the next call, see the uh, next call there? Yes. And that's a call from... 203-606-8969 incoming, is that correct? Could you move the page just a oh, bit? Oh, I'm sorry. The, the answer is... The little screen doesn't show. <laughs> the answer is yes, but I just want to see it. Just to... Is that correct? That's right, yes. Okay, can you tell us, uh, describe what that call is, please? So that call is an incoming call at 103 and 54 seconds. Um, the start of the call is served by cell 298. End of call is served by cell 296. And what is the duration of that particular call now at 103, beginning at 103 in the morning? 241 seconds. And did you go to those two cell locations? cell site locations there, 298 and 296. I did, yes. And I'm going to show you uh, 298. Do you recognize that? I do. That's a flagpole site, yes. And uh, where is that located, please? Uh, in terms of address, it is at 811 Stonington Road in Stonington, Connecticut. 
And where is that in relationship to uh, the highway, Route 95? Also along 95. And I believe you previously described uh, cell site 296 for us. Yes. Um, you recognize that? Yes. And what is that? Uh, in terms of address, it's 227 Boombridge Road in Stonington, Connecticut. It's actually North Stonington. And uh, I believe you previously indicated that that was also along Route 95. Is that correct? Yeah. Now, these series of calls, which direction is the cell phone moving along the tower? Objection. <clears throat> you just described a series of cell phone towers, correct? Uh, going all the way back to, uh, I believe, let's say, uh, cell site 292, correct? That's right. And which direction? Uh, are those cell sites moving? Are they moving in a continuous direction? Objection. The sites don't move. Sustain. <clears throat> Which direction is the cell phone moving along the cell sites, if you know? Objection. The cell site locations are um, in order east, uh, west towards the east. And, it, and are they all along Route 95? Correct. And in which direction of Route 95 would you be going in order to move along the cell sites in that manner? To make that sequence, you would be going along 95 north. See that next call there? I do. And can you tell us uh, from where does that call come? So in terms of phone number, that's an yes. inbound incoming call from 203-606-8969. I may want to just back up just briefly. <clears throat> Sir, just generally speaking, I think in regards to my last question, if I may, Your Honor, just uh, um, generally speaking, is that consistent with the phone moving north along the cell sites that you've described? Those, those last Sorry, number of cell I... sites to beginning on and trying to get away from the route, if I may, Your Honor. Just not with respect to whether it's traveling on Route 95 or not, <clears throat> the movement from the towers that you described from 292 to the last one that you've just described prior to this, is that generally consistent with the phone moving north? West to east. Okay. Fair enough. This next uh, particular cell site, do you see that? I do. And can you tell us, uh, I believe you were describing um, the telephone call there. Is that true? Yes. Please uh, tell us what that call is. 
So that's an incoming call from phone number 203-606-8969, occurring at uh, <coughs> 1 in the morning, 8 minutes and 15 seconds, for a duration of 14 seconds, served by cell site 150. And uh, have you been to cell site 150? I have, yes. And I'm going to show you uh, this photograph. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What's depicted in that photograph? That's our cell site to the left of the picture, on the left side of the picture. And um, <clears throat> um, is that located here? Yes, that's right. And uh, where is that uh, particular cell site in relationship to Route uh, 95? It is also along 95 at the address of 395 Woodville Road in Hopkinton, Rhode Island. Now, that telephone call there at the top of the next page? I do. Can you tell us what that telephone call is, please? So that's an outgoing call to phone number 860-502-2593, occurring at 1.15 in the morning and 12 seconds for a duration of 67 seconds. Uh, the start of a call is served by cell 151. End of call is served by cell 69. And I'm going to show you uh, cell uh, 151, uh, can you tell us, do you recognize, well, do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? That's our site located to the east of the photo on the that, e eastern side. Is that here? Yes. And um, you see obviously Route 95 in, in the photo as well, is that correct? Yes. And uh, where is that located? At 14 Buttonwood Road, Button Woods, excuse me, Road in Wyoming, Rhode Island. And again, um, does that service uh, Route 95? Yes. And um, in relationship to the prior uh, cell sites that you've described, where is that located? Um, uh, out of Connecticut into Rhode Island along 95. And you said that it, uh, the call ended at uh, cell site 69, is that correct? Yes. And do you recognize that? I do. And where is that located? Uh, that's also along 95 at, at the address of 352 Woodville Alton Road in Hopkinton, Rhode Island. And um, obviously uh, Route 95 is indicated there in the photograph, is that correct? That's right, yes. And is this your cell location here? Yeah, just, just off your screen, but yes, on the right-hand side of the photo, yes. And um, in relationship to the last cell site that you just described, the beginning of this particular call, mm -hmm. where, are, where are we in relationship to Route 95? It's also along Route 95, but 95 starts to veer to the north as opposed to east and west. This next uh, call here, do you recognize that? Yes. And um, what time does that call take place, please? At 1.27 a.m. and 12 seconds. And um, what's the duration of that call? 25 seconds. And can you tell us what cell site is used to connect that call? That is served by cell site 55. And where is cell site 55 located? That's in uh, Coventry, Rhode Island. And um, You've previously described that cell site for us, I believe? I have, yes. <clears throat> Should 
show you this photograph, you recognize that? Yes. And I believe you previously described that that's your cell location, is that correct? It is, yes. The next uh, call, do you recognize that? I do. And um, what time does that uh, call occur? At 1.27 and 58 seconds in the AM. And um, what uh, cell site is used to connect your customer to the uh, Sprint network in regards to that call? Same site, cell 55. And um, you see this very next call here? Yes. And uh, can you tell us what, what is the calling number in that particular uh, call? So that's an inbound call, incoming call from phone number 203-606-8969, occurring at 138 and 28 seconds, 22 seconds, excuse me. And what's the duration? Um, that is 25 seconds. Now, those three calls that you just described, are they routed someplace in the, uh, in the network? So that, that reference to the routed call, those are actually uh, routed to voicemail. Each three of those, is that correct? Correct, yes. And each of them using that same uh, cell site location, 55 in Coventry, Rhode Island, is that correct? Yes. Now, this uh, next call, do you recognize that call? Yes. And uh, tell us what that call is, please. That's an outgoing call occurring at 1.45 and 13 seconds in the AM. And um, where does that call go to? That uh, is going to phone number 860-502-2593. And uh, what cell site is used to connect your uh, cell phone 4304 to the network at that time? Start of the call is on cell site 148. And you previously described 148 for us, is that correct? I have, yes. And is that cell site 148 located there? Yeah, on the left side of, the, of that photo, yes. Now, in relationship to cell site 55, where is cell site uh, 148, please? Coventry would be south of West Greenwich, I believe. And um, that call uh, ends at another location, is that correct? Yeah, the end of call is served by cell 147. And where is cell 147 located? Uh, at the address of 830 Noose Neck Hill Road in West Greenwich. Rhode Island. Rhode Island, Island. yes, correct. And the next call that is uh, placed uh, to your uh, customer's phone, 4304, from where does that call come? That's an incoming call from phone number 617-930-1341. And where, where does your uh, customer's cell phone connect to the network during the course of that call? That's cell 276 and um, I believe you previously described cell number 276 for us, is that correct? I have, yes. I'll show you that, do you recognize that? I do. And what do you recognize that to be? So that's the uh, cell site at address 75 Robert Street in Groton, Connecticut. And that call now is some um, um, more than half an hour after the call immediately preceding it. Is that correct? Yeah, right about 32 minutes later, yes. At 2.17 in the morning? Correct. Yes. And does that call go someplace? That's also a voicemail call? The next call, <clears throat> um, so the, that first call is at 2.17.07, correct? Right. The very next call incoming is at uh, 218.13. Correct. On June 18th, the morning of June 18th, is that correct? Yes. Does that also come from 617-930-1341? Yes, that's an incoming call, yes. And um, does that call go someplace? Also routed to voicemail? 
and is the same uh, cell phone tower, cell site 276 used to connect your customer's phone to the network <coughs> there? Yes. See that very next call now at 219 and 46 seconds? Yes. Um, from where does that call? What telephone number does that call come from? 617-930-1341. And um, does that uh, call go someplace um, in, in your network? Also routed to voicemail, if that's your question. Yes. Yes. And uh, does, how does your uh, customer cell phone 4304 uh, connect to the network during the course of that call? Start a call is uh, from cell 276. End of call is from cell 271. Beginning at the Groton, Connecticut site? Yeah, 276 is the Groton site, yes. And ending at this, do you recognize this particular cell site? I do, yes. And uh, can you tell us where your cell site is located in that photograph? So cell 271 is located at 41 Manitoc Hill in Waterford, Connecticut. And is that that location there? Yes. And where is that in relationship to uh, Route 95 now, please? That's... Um, South of 95, but providing coverage along 95. Yes. Now, you see this very uh, next cell phone call? I do. And from whom does that call come, please? That's phone number 203-606-8969. And um, what time does that call come in? At 2.20 a.m. and 29 seconds. And um, can you tell us what's the duration of that call, please? 18 seconds. And uh, what cell uh, site is used to connect your uh, customer 4304 to the network during that call? That's cell 214. And you've been to cell 214, is that correct? I have, yes. And I can show you that photograph. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What's depicted in that photograph? So this is our site here on the right-hand side of the photo, of the photo. yes. That location there? Correct. And where is that cell site located in relationship to Route 95, please? So that is the address of 99 Briar Hill Road in Groton, which is uh, also providing coverage to 95. Do you see this next incoming call? I do. And uh, from where, or what's the telephone number that's calling into your customer's number, uh, 4304, please? That's uh, phone number 617-930-1341. And what time of the uh, day on June 18th does that telephone call take place, please? 2.20 a.m. and 57 seconds. And what's the duration of that particular telephone call, please? 76 seconds. And can you tell us um, what tower uh, is used to connect your customer 4304 to the uh, Sprint network during the course of that telephone call? Start of call is uh, cell site 213. And you've been to site 213, is that correct? I have, yes. And do you recognize in that photograph your cell site 213? Yeah, well, this one's hard to see, but yes, we're located on a small tower. A small stub tower, if you will. And, uh, right where my finger is now? That's exactly right, yes. And uh, where is that location in relationship to uh, Route 95, please? That's, uh, that's in New London, Connecticut, also serving uh, I-95. Do you see this very next call? Or sorry, that, that, that call um, is routed, correct? That incoming call indicates routed, is that correct? Yes. This very next uh, cell phone call at uh, 226 and 30 seconds, um, that's also a routed call, is that correct? Yes. And can you tell us uh, from what uh, number is that call coming? So that's from phone number 617-930-1341. And um, <clears throat> how long does that particular telephone call last? 71 seconds. And what... Um, Cell site is used to connect your customer 4304 to the Sprint network, please. Start of call on cell 274. 
End of call on 273. I believe you previously described 274 for us, is that correct? I have, yes. That's this uh, cell tower, is that correct? Yes, in Waterford, Connecticut. Yes, in Nyanta, Connecticut. Now the very next uh, incoming call, do you see that on the record? I do. And uh, could you tell us, please, <clears throat> from where does that call come, cell phone number? Uh, that's... Uh, an incoming call from 203-606-8969. And um, <clears throat> how long does that call last? That's a 31-second call. And it begins at what time, please? At 2.58 a.m. and 46 seconds. And can you tell us uh, what cell site is used to connect your customer to the uh, Sprint network during the course of that call? That's uh, cell site 34. And I show you this photograph. You recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes. What's depicted in that photograph? Please? So that's our cell site located at 201 Main Street in Cromwell, Connecticut. And is that that location there? Yes. And is that where that uh, cell site is in relationship to Route 9? Yes, it's right along Route 9, yes. See this... Um, Next uh, cell phone call, or an incoming cell phone call? I do. And can you describe, please, what time does that call come in? At 3.03 .03 a.m. and 11 seconds. And um, uh, how long does that call last? That's a 46-second call. And can you tell us what tower is used to connect your cell phone uh, customer to the network during the course of that call? That's uh, cell ID 41. And you've been to that site, is that correct? I have, yes. And I show you that uh, photograph. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes, that's our site on the right-hand side of the picture. Is that this location here? Yep, right about there, yes. And um, where is this, um, where is uh, Cromwell, Connecticut um, located um, in relationship to Bristol, Connecticut and to Route 9, as you described? So it's actually at the intersection of Route 9 and 91. Uh, would be east of Bristol. You see this uh, next uh, call? Yes. And um, <clears throat> tell us, please, uh, uh, what time does that, what kind of call is that? That's an outgoing call. And at what time does that call go out? At 3.35 a.m. and 23 seconds. And can you tell us uh, what um, cell site is used to connect your customer to the uh, Sprint network during the course of that call? Cell site 68. And where is uh, cell site 68 located? Please? At 225 North Main Street in Bristol, Connecticut. And I show you this photograph. Do you recognize that photograph? I do. And what's depicted in that photograph, please? That's our, lo our cell site location. And where is your cell site located in this photograph? Uh, over here, the, the uh, also a small antenna array on the right-hand side of the photo, yes. Here? That's right. Fingers. Yes. And can you tell us, please, these next series of uh, 
cell phone calls, 336, 337, 341, 347, 358. Those are all outgoing calls, is that correct? Yeah, all outgoing calls served by uh, cell 68 in Bristol, Connecticut. And this next activity uh, from that time down to... I lost the ruler. I'm sorry. There you go. Down to 6.24 a.m. All of that activity, call activity, is on that cell site 68. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. And then just direct your attention now to this call. Do you recognize that particular call? I do, yes. And what is that call, please? That's a routed call to voicemail at 7.17 a.m. and 51 seconds. And that's an incoming call from... 203-606-8969, is that correct? Yes, it would have, yeah, it's, it's routed, but yes. And that call, that comes off of, uh, what tower is used to connect that call, for, uh, the cell 4304 to the spread network, what cell site is used there? That's cell 129. And that's? This very first cell site that you described for us uh, this afternoon, is that correct? Yeah, that's right, yes. And calls here. Following outgoing call from 4304 to 8969 at 719 in the morning. That also uses uh, cell site 129, is that correct? Yes. Incoming call here at uh, 719 also uses that uh, cell site 129, is that correct? Yes, that's that right. Incoming call from 8969, is that correct? That one there? Yes, that's right. Now, looking at the bottom of the page there, <coughs> this call that's incoming mm -hmm. at uh, 8 o'clock and 50 seconds, do you recognize that? I do, yes. And uh, what uh, cell site is used to connect the 4304 number to the, to the uh, network during that call? So that's uh, cell ID 1. And uh, I show you this photograph. Do you recognize what's depicted in that photograph? Yes, that's our site. And where is the site located in, in this photograph, please? Uh, top of the white water tank here. That's, here? that's right, yes. And where is uh, this um, cell site in relationship to uh, Bristol, <coughs> Connecticut, the 129 site as you've described it? Farmington is uh, east, north, northeast of Bristol. And this location, you've been to that location? I have, yes. And uh, where, just describe geographically that particular location, please. Um, the Farmington yes. location? With reference to, with, I, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. Um, is it at a, at a particular height or um, in relationship to the, the uh, land around it? Uh, Farmington, I understand your, your question, yes. So Farmington, Avon, um, areas kind of north and, and east of Bristol do become hilly and, and, and actually mountainous, and Avon Mountain is, is right in through that area. And these next uh, cell sites here, uh, 146, mm -hmm. uh, have you been there? I have, yes. And show you that photograph. Uh, does that depict your cell site 146? Yes, we're also located on the top of that water tank, right there. That location there? That's right, yes. And where is 146, please? 
um, at the address of 232 Stevens Street in Bristol, Connecticut. I do. And uh, could you tell us what cell site was used to connect uh, 4304 to the network during the course of that call? Can you slide to the left a little bit? Yeah, so that was connected by, uh, excuse me, served by cell 129. And um, this one, I'm sorry, right above it as well, did that begin? Oh, I'm sorry. At a uh, particular location? So if, if I go back, so at 821 and, and and 56 seconds. Um, start of the call was cell 92, end of call was 129. And I'm showing you 92? Yes. Do you recognize that? I do, yes. And uh, you've been to that location, is that correct? Yes. And where is that located? That's at 81 Montvideo Road, if I say it right. That's, uh, that's really located on the top of Avon Mountain that I re referred to a minute ago. It's very high with reference to the surrounding sites. So during the course of that 73 second call, the, the uh, 4304 connected first with that location and then with 129, which is the first site that we use, is that correct? Yes, that's right. And you're down to 9, 10 in the morning on June 18th, you recognize that particular call? I do. And can you tell us what uh, cell um, site was used to connect that particular call uh, to uh, your customer's quote, which is depicted in that photograph? Yes, that's our site to the eastern side of the, of the right-hand side of the photo, excuse me. Right there, is that correct? Yes. And where is uh, that in location, or in relationship to uh, Bristol, Connecticut? So that's, uh, that's at the address of 119 New Britain Avenue in Farmington, so also north and east of and Bristol. distance-wise, what type of distance are we talking about? Ooh, in the neighborhood of seven, I'm going to say eight miles apart. Now, this next series of calls, do you recognize them? Yes. And those... Um, calls use the uh, same cell site up uh, until the last cell at the 11:14 uh, a.m. on June 18th uh, call, is that correct? Yeah, end of call is served by 141. Now, the, the uh, other calls, the, they begin and end at uh, 171, is that correct? Cell site 171. Oh, yes, yes, that's right. You've been to cell site 171, is that correct? I have, yes. And uh, that's uh, cell site 171 there? It is. And can you point that out, please, and identify where your cell site is located there? Right here, just left of center. Yeah, that's right. Right there? Yes. And where is that located? That's at 277 Huckleberry Hill Road in Avon, Connecticut. And that 141 cell site, you've previously uh, shown us that as well. <coughs> yes. You've previously shown us this cell site, uh, one in Farmington, Connecticut, is that correct? Cell one, yes. And previously shown us this 146 at Stevens Road and uh, Stevens Street in Bristol, Connecticut, correct? Yes. And that 129, that's the very first cell site you described for us? That's right. And 68, as we move down here? Yes. That's also in Bristol, Connecticut, is that correct? 225 North Main Street in Bristol, yes. Now, <clears throat> Moving 
looking down here to um, June 18th at uh, 3.39 in the afternoon. Do you see that particular call? I do. And can you tell us uh, what was the <coughs> beginning or site that was used to connect your customer during the course of that call? So 162. And you've been to cell 162, is that correct? Yes. Show you that photograph. Do you recognize where it's depicted in that photograph? Yeah, that's our site on the right-hand side. Right, right there? Here. Yes. And where is that in relationship to uh, Bristol, Connecticut, please? That is in Plymouth, Connecticut, so it's actually northwest. And about how far away from Bristol, approximately? Uh, slightly further. I'll say about 10 miles, maybe 12. And that uh, ends with a... Uh, Cell site uh, 25, is that correct? Yes. And you recognize that? I do. And what's that, please? That's our site uh, pictured on the left-hand side of your photo. That one there, is that correct? Yes. And <clears throat> that's located in uh, Bristol, is that correct? It is, yes. <clears throat> And then move back to that 129 site. I'm right. Sorry. We're at the uh, yeah. So 129 is that correct? Yes. And in the course of uh, that call, also connects with the uh, cell site that uh, identified as number 69. Is that correct? Yes, but you'll have to move just to the right, sorry. to the left. But yes, it is. Show you that photograph. Do you recognize that? I do. And what is that? That's our site uh, located at 10 Spark Street in Plainville, Connecticut. And is that your site located there? Yes. And uh, in relationship to Bristol, what type of distance are we talking about? I uh, would say about four to five miles. It's slightly south of Bristol. next series of calls are all at cell sites that you previously described, correct? 129, 68, 69, correct? Yes. Now you see this call here? No. Nope. Now I do. <laughs> What cell site uh, is used in the course of that call? So that's served by cell 62. And you've been to 62, is that correct? I have, yes. And I show you that photograph, you recognize that? Yes. Where is that located, please? We are um, on the rooftop to the right-hand side, just right at the center of your picture. And this? this yes, here? that's right. Now, the rest of these are all cell sites that you've previously described for us, is that correct? Yes.
Thank you. Is that the exhibit that was marked for ratification? Good afternoon. So you toured a whole bunch of cell sites uh, in Massachusetts, <laughs> Rhode Island, and Connecticut, right? Yeah. Okay. And did you do that um, by yourself, or did it go with somebody else? Um, half and half. I did the Connecticut. Right, why don't you tell us how you did it? Sure. So the um, the sites. In Rhode Island and in Boston, I toured with uh, one of the state troopers. The sites in Connecticut, I toured myself. Okay. And uh, who took the photographs? I have taken some photographs. Well, who took the photographs, all of these photographs that uh, the jury just saw during your direct examination, sir? I created those. Okay. Um, and how did, you how did you create those? My photographs were not great. So I didn't I, ask you how great they are, I just asked you how you did it, please. So those are actually snapshots um, in our database. I was able to reference site by site, and then I took a, um, uh, a snapshot of the satellite photo, zoomed into that area. All right, so these were not shots that you took while you were visiting the site. Right, yeah, those were not great. They're kind of just, uh, they're, in, they're in some database somewhere. Correct. All right. Uh, but you personally visited each and every one of these, you said, what, 47 sites? Uh, I could tell you exactly. Yeah, there were 47 different and, sites. And can I just ask you, what, what are you referring to, sir? I've, I have my packet of notes here. Okay. Those are, can I approach her? Of course. Can I just see those for a Of course. All right. So, so it's so a package. These are, these are the notes that you took about what you did. Same packet we've seen, yes. And then the... Are these, are these your notes, sir? Those are, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, you can have them. Thank you. So you toured some of these 47 sites, you said, with the state trooper. I did, yes. Those are the ones in Rhode Island and Massachusetts? Yes. Okay. And uh, when did you do that? Oh... Uh, I don't know exactly. Say, well, what year? This year. Say okay. a month and a half ago, two okay, months. Okay, recently. Ago. Recently. Okay. And then you toured the ones in Connecticut by yourself. Yes. Okay. And you told us that you looked at 131 calls. Yeah. In the yes. Okay. And all of this work that you did, this was all done at the request of the prosecution, right? Yes. Okay. And just give us an estimate. About how long did all of this work that you did take you? I would say in the neighborhood of 20 to 30 hours. I don't know. 30, 20, 30 seems high. Probably 20 hours. You went to all of these 47 places in 20 hours? You know, I, I haven't done the math. Well, just give I, us I the have a timesheet that I have to submit as being assigned to this case, so... I'm guessing. Okay. And you weren't doing this for free, right? No, no, I'm assigned to this case. That's okay. Right. But uh, uh, this was based on a contract between Sprint and the DA's office, right? Correct, yes. Okay. And do you happen to recall the rate that you were getting paid? The, for company, the, the company bills at $250 an hour. Okay. Now, the very first, uh, I just have one question about it. the very first uh, tower cell site tower that uh, the jury saw this morning. That was that big smokestack in Bristol, right? That's right. Was it called the Glasky smokestack or something? Yes. Okay. I'm just curious, how, how do you get up there to put that antenna all the way up there? I don't do that. The tower crews do that. Do you have any idea how that gets done? Yeah, I've watched them work, yes. How do they do that? Uh, Depends. Some crane, some uh, some rope work. 
Okay. It's a little bit of hoist and tackle, I guess, if you will. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to ask you a few questions about cell phones. Uh, okay. So let's try to keep it as simple as we can, okay? Sure. All right. So am I correct that uh, you mentioned the word radio uh, waves or radio this morning, right? I did, yes. Okay. And are cell phones essentially like a two-way radio? Transmitter and receiver, yes. Okay. And so a cell phone transmits and receives radio waves, right? Yes. Okay. And those radio waves kind of go up into the, to the sky? Is that how it works? Not necessarily, no. They're, they're directed based on the antenna pattern, which is usually directed outward and down to where the customers would be. Okay. Uh, and uh, it looks like these cell towers you, or cell sites, you try to get them high up, right? Is that fair? Yeah. Yes, it's fair, yes. Not okay. too high because we don't want the interference issues we talked about this morning. Okay. Well, uh, why do you try to get them high up? What's the, what's the point of that? Again, it's a balance between coverage capacity and interference. We try to provide the largest coverage area while providing for the most, com most customers at one time, simultaneous users, if you will, without interfering within our own network or incurring interference from other sources. Okay. So each of these cell sites has a certain coverage area, they right? They do, yes. Okay. And that coverage area, uh, especially, I think you said, out in, a, in, a, in the country, out in a rural area, mm -hmm. that coverage area can be quite big, right? Yeah, sure. It can be tens of, tens of square miles, right? Yeah, in the neighborhood of 10 is, is probably max. Okay. But it could be a number of square miles. Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. From one cell site, right? Yes. Okay. And uh, you just mentioned a minute ago, and you mentioned earlier, what you called the interference piece, right? I did, yes. And what, in, is that referring to the fact that uh, these radio waves can be interfered with by different kinds of things? Sure. Okay. So these radio waves that are uh, connecting between the cell site and the cell phone, for example, they can be interfered with um, by buildings. Right? Uh, blocked by buildings would be more accurate, but okay. You, Block. Yeah. Well, is would you say that blocking is a form of interference? No. Okay. Well, tell <laughs> us what you mean by blocking. Then. So, so um, your coverage would be limited by a building. It would be shielded or shadowed by a building. You're not going to penetrate the building necessarily if your antennas are on the other side of it. When I speak of interference, I mean in terms of um, pollution, so to speak, an elevated noise floor with reference to your your radio. All right, the, just a second. Now you're losing me. So let me let, let right. me let me uh, try to bring it down. Two all different right. things. Is it fair to say there are two different ways that uh, my cell phone call can get messed up? One of them is by blocking, and a second is interference, and those are two different things. Yes. Okay. So one way my cell phone call can get messed up is blocking, right? Sure. Okay. And blocking can be like a building or a tree or a wall or something that's physically between my cell phone and the antenna, right? Yes, an obstruction. Okay, an obstruction. Okay. And a second way that my cell phone call can get messed up is with interference, right? Correct. Okay. And that can be like from weather, right? Like rain or something like that? Not necessarily. Not as commonly as you would think. Okay. Well, what, well tell us what uh, kinds of uh, things would, uh, can mess up a cell phone call by what you describe as interference. Other radios. I'm sorry? Other radios. So other what? Other radios, noise generated from other electronics, for okay, example. Okay, like other stuff that's going back and forth somewhere. Yes. Okay. Electronic noise. Is that yes, a, absolutely. Right. Okay, electronic noise. And so either because of the blocking or the interference, um, one way those things can mess up a call is they can, I think you referred to this earlier, they can ca cause a cell phone call to be dropped, right? Yes. And that means that all of a sudden you're talking and then the call is like dead, right? That's right, yes. Okay. Now, <laughs> yeah. 
you showed us these 47 sites earlier today, right? I did, yes. Okay. But in fact, that's only a small part of all of the Sprint cell sites in that geographical area. Oh, yeah, right? absolutely. Okay. There are hundreds of Sprint cell sites in eastern Massachusetts, Rhode Island, and uh, eastern Connecticut, right? That's right, yes. Okay. Not just 47, right? No, no. All right. And each of those sites has a certain, each of those hundreds of sites has a different coverage area, right? They do, yes. Okay. And those coverage areas, um, they tend to overlap, right? Yes. Okay. And am I correct that my cell phone call will not necessarily connect to the closest cell site? That can be true, yes. All right. And that's because the network is designed, is it not, to look for the strongest and the best quality site to connect my call. Correct. All right. And that's not always the one that's geographically closest, is it? I would agree with that, yes. Okay. And similarly, you talked about, uh, I think you used two different word, uh, terms, handover and handoff, right? Yeah, I, I, it's really the same thing. All right. Which of those do you prefer? Um, I would probably say hand over more, okay. more frequently. Hand over. So, and, a, and am I correct that a handover is where uh, I made my cell phone call and it's connected to a particular site and then at some point during the call, the network hands me over, hands my call over to a different cell phone site, right? Yes, okay. absolutely. That's a handover, right? It is. Okay. Now, that does not necessarily mean that I'm moving, right? No, yeah, you could be in the same position. I could be in the, I could be sitting in the exact same place on my call and in the middle of that call, for some network reason, the network may decide to switch my call from tower XYZ to tower ABC. Yes, but what we do is try to optimize it so that we don't ping pong, if you remember mention, mentioned Right, you don't, want to, you don't want me to send me back and forth, right? Absolutely. Okay, so yes. if you switch me, you're probably just going to switch me once? Yeah, in, yeah, there's some care into how quickly or frequently you switch, yes. Okay, but in any event, I can get switched while standing still. Sure. Okay, or that is my phone can be standing still, yes. right? Yes, okay. more accurately, yes. And, uh, and that's because this, a cell phone site that's geographically further away, for example, from, from the site that my call started at, may have a stronger, clearer signal. Based on the prioritization of the neighbor list, yes. Okay. And the network, and this, is, this is all done like automatically by super duper computers, right? <laughs> well, we optimize it to work that way, but yes. All right. It's not like some person sitting in some office somewhere who decides to switch my call from one tower to another, right? No, that would be impractical. Yeah, okay, <laughs> good. Okay. And aside from that the, that the closest geographical tower may not have the strongest, uh, clearest signal, the, the, the geographically closest site may be unavailable for a variety of reasons, right? It could be. Okay, so for example, that big list that we saw earlier of all these sites, for a lot of, uh, there were, remember there were a lot of entries that said, uh, uh, it said, I think the column was on air status? Yes, I remember. And in that column there was a, remember seeing the word pending a lot? Pending, yes. pending, 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 okay. So where it says pending, I mean, does that suggest that maybe that for one reason or another that site at that time is not available? I would feel more comfortable um, looking at if you had a specific example, but yeah, it could be that, yeah. All right. Maybe that they're having some work being done on it, for example. Does that ever happen? Yes, but I don't think you'd find it in that log. It wouldn't, so, say, what it wouldn't say why it's pending in that log. It just says pending, right? Yeah, that's, that's true, yes. All right, but in any event, 
the geographically closest cell site may be unavailable to service my call for a variety of reasons. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. And now, and, and if I'm standing like directly under a cell phone site, okay. you said that those, that the antennas are pointed outward, right? Yeah, the energy is really radi radiated outward and downward, yes. Okay. So if I'm like right below the site, uh, am I going to connect with that site or is are, are the, because the antenna is going out, going out and down, it's going to miss me underneath? No, I understand your question, but no, no. The signal would be strong enough where you would be picked it up. It would still get me. if I Absolutely, yes. Okay. All right. If it was, but it might not be, that might not be the strongest, clearest signal, right? If you're right under the site, that's yes, the strongest and clearest. Okay. It'll, if, I'm under, if I'm directly there, that's the one it's probably, that's that I'm probably going to connect yes. to. Right. If it's available, right? If it's available. Okay. Now, am I correct that with respect to text messages, mm -hmm. Verizon does not, I'm sorry, apologize, wrong company, that's Sprint. Okay. Strike me down. Uh, Sprint does not keep uh, any kind of cell site information on text messages, right? I don't know that firsthand, but I would agree with that. Okay. So, uh, are you familiar with this with this with this concept of of gateways that are used for text messages? Yeah, I mean, they're really it's a different server. It's a whole different per system. se than the switch. Okay. Yes. So if I send a text message on my uh, my Sprint phone, there's not going to be uh, cell site information available, uh, which will reflect the site that uh, serviced that text message because it's not serviced through a cell site, right? Within the call records, if yeah, if that's correct. Right. Okay. And what about voicemails? Do voicemails uh, are 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 cell site inform is cell site information uh, available for voicemails where there's no actual uh, connection between the between the parties? I believe those were the routed calls that we looked at. Okay, and with respect to those calls, uh, is cell site information available or not? If you know, I, I believe. They are, but oh, I'd have to go. I'd have to have an example up. All right. Well, I don't. I, I, you're not sure. Is that fair to say? That's fair to say. Okay. I want to be correct. Okay. I want you to be correct, sir. Okay. <laughs> now, am I correct that you can't really tell where exactly where a cell phone is? during any particular time from these records, can you? Based on these records, we talk about coverage area within the cell site. Okay. Let me ask my question again. Coverage area, we've already, you've already explained, can encompass a number of square miles, right? Uh-huh. Okay. So if, you, if, if the records reflect that a particular cell site serviced a call, that tells you that that phone was somewhere within that cell site's coverage area, right? Correct, yes. Okay. But other than telling you that that cell phone is somewhere within that cell site's coverage area, which can be a number of miles, you can't tell precisely where that phone is, right? That's right. Okay. Because the records don't tell you where within that coverage area the phone is, right? In these in these billing records, that's correct. Yes. Well, in these billing records, so you're I mean, you're referring to the records that you were asked about by Mr. Bomberg on direct examination, yes. right? Yes. Okay. Because all these records reflect is a cell site number, right? Start a call, end a call, cell right. site served. Yes. So it tells you that the phone is somewhere within the coverage area of that cell site. Yes. That's all that it tells you, right? Yes. Okay. Those records don't tell you precisely where, where within that coverage area that
that phone is, correct? Yes. Okay. And, of course, those records don't tell you who's on that phone, right? They reference a the phone number, if that's what you mean. Well, they don't tell you who is using that oh, particular phone, right? That's correct, yes. Okay. Yes. Now, am I correct that there is a different way to figure out the precise location of a cell phone so called there's, GPS? There's, there's actually two other types of, of, I guess, call records, if you will. There's, there's two other ways to do it, yes, sure. Okay, why don't you tell us what those two other ways are? So you could um, typically, through law enforcement, uh, have, I guess, a call trace, or usually when the data is presented, it's referred to as ping data, which is a software application or a um, scheduled event which would force the phone to register. Um, measurements would be collected on more than three sites, for example, and then a cell phone could be triangulated. So. Uh, when that information is provided, you would get similar, uh, a similar capture, start of call, uh, location, and also a variance in terms of distance of where that phone was located based on how it reported and its triangulation. Okay. So that particular technique, uh, which would allow you to uh, hone in on the actual location of a phone mm -hmm. is called triangulation, right? Correct. That's okay. one type, by the way. Okay, we're going to get to the other one. Okay. okay. You were not provided that any of that kind of information in this case, were you, sir? No, I was not. Okay. Tell us what the method is to uh, hone in precisely on the location of a cell phone. So at, within the phone itself, there's uh, location-based services, geo services, if you will. Is that, is, when I say GPS, is that, yep. am I in that same ballpark? Absolutely. Okay, so if tell you, us how that works. If you took a picture, for example, based on the GPS that's in the phone, it, it, and, it, and you go through your camera roll, as you've seen, uh, a lot of times it'll give you a, a town, and then if you went into that, uh, and, and they do that to categorize it, I guess, um, just to make it easier when you go through your camera roll. But if you went into that actual picture in that photo itself, you would see uh, actual latitude and longitude coordinates in there. So that's one thing. And then uh, most people don't turn their location services off. So any, the majority of apps that you use would also somehow tie back into your GPS system. So if, again, if you physically had the phone and you used, I guess, some method to, to reference those apps, you could probably get GPS data and you could have real locations of that phone. Okay. And you were not provided any of that kind of data in this case, were no. you? No, I wasn't. All right. So you testified earlier about lots of calls. Is that fair to say? Yes. Okay. Lots. And these were lots of calls that were made to or from uh, the phone number of your customer, uh, eight six phone number eight six zero eight four five four three zero four, right? That is correct. And yes. some of those calls were uh, handled by a cell site in Massachusetts, right? Yes. And some of them were handled by a cell site in Rhode Island, right? Yes. And some of them were handled by a cell site in Connecticut, right? Yes. Okay. So all of these hundreds of pages of records tell you absolutely nothing about the content of any of those calls. Isn't that right? Yeah, I mean, it's start a call, end a call. That's right. You don't know anything about the content of any of those calls you've testified about today, do you? No. And you're not here to speculate about that, are you? I would not do that, no. Thank you, sir. <coughs> Good. Um, Mr. Sultan was asking you about uh, what you described essentially as pinging a phone, correct? Yes. Now, <clears throat> that information that you described about uh, later being able to potentially triangulate the location of the phone, that doesn't happen as the user is using the phone unless somebody has already been authorized previously 
to ping the phone, correct? Yeah, it's, it's not done by the user of the phone. It's done by a third party. Correct. Meaning there's no way to go backwards historically into the record and ping the phone where it was at calls that happened prior. That's right. Right? Yeah. So you can't uh, on uh, June 21st say, I want to ping the phone for June 16th, correct? Correct, yes. You can't on June uh, 22nd say, I want to ping the phone for June 18th, correct? Right. You have to know ahead of time that you want to do it. True? Yes, that's true. The phone sprint isn't accumulating that historical information, correct? No, we're not, no. And you describe that you can look into a phone uh, and obtain sometimes GPS if the GPS is turned on and it's been used to do something that has left a mark there in the phone, correct? Yeah, most people don't turn their phones off, so those apps kind of run. But it requires you to have the physical phone, doesn't it? In order to look into the phone and yeah, see where it's Yeah, that's true too, yes. And so, um, I'm going to show you. Exhibit number 246, the record for 4304, right? Yes. The very last page, uh, 556. You see that? I do. And you see all that activity inbound, 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 routed? Right. You see all that? I do. And um, all of that indicates that there's no outbound activity uh, on that phone from the dates of June 26, 2013 at 9.33 to July 29th of 2013, correct? That's right. Those are all inbound calls. Yes. And so somewhere there exists a physical phone and Sprint is looking for that phone uh, when there's inbound activity to it, correct? I don't understand the question. Well, 4304 exists as a physical phone at, at, at some point in time, correct? Yes. And that record indicates that the 4304 account is still active and there's phone numbers calling it. Oh, yes. Right? Yes. And Sprint is, is sending information to the physical phone, but the physical phone isn't sending anything out. We're capturing that data, yes. Right? Yes. Page 555, routed calls, inbound calls, no outgoing calls, correct? That's correct, yes. And that's from the date of June 23rd, 2013 at 9.59 p.m. through June 26th at 9.22 a.m., correct? Correct. So there's no activity going out from the physical phone uh, anywhere during that period of time, correct? That's true, yes. Show you page 554, you recognize that? I do. Inbound, routed, in, uh, routed, routed, inbound, all the way up to, you see that, as the last outbound activity? I do, yes. June 20th of 2013 at uh, 10.03 uh, p.m., correct? Correct, yes. And in order to look into 4304 to see if it had a GPS that was turned on and capturing any GPS data, you have to be able to find... 4304, correct? The actual physical phone. True? Yeah, that's true, yes. <laughs> now, Mr. Sultan asked you about 10 square miles uh, of coverage in a rural area. Do you recall him asking you about that? I do, that? yes. Now, <clears throat> when you previously described drive testing, <clears throat> that it essentially could allow you to map out the actual coverage area, not this sort of uh, rural uh, maximum. True? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. And um, when uh, Mr. Sultan's asking you about 10 square miles, that's uh, an area of, uh, that's a measurement of area, correct? Yeah, so I mean, I could put a lot of corrections in there as a general 
measurement, but yes, it's a square mileage, and I'm speaking in terms of a sector, for example. Yes. Okay. And so that's a box, essentially, two and a quarter miles by approximately two and a quarter miles to get to a square mile. It's, we'll say it's a defined coverage area of a sector, yes. Okay. Now, <clears throat> You were uh, discussing buildings and uh, how they can shield or block uh, uh, self or the radio signal, correct? That's right. Now, it, it, it's fair to say you, you can get a, uh, a cell phone signal from inside of a building, true? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and so when you're talking about it blocking or shadowing versus somebody who's, say, in their house using a phone in their basement, in their wherever they are, uh, what do you what do you mean by that? So yeah, thank you. That again was I was generalizing, but the bottom line is the signal would be weakened by uh, walls, glass, that kind of thing, attenuated, if you will. But in the in in the example of an urban site, I mean, we have many sites blocks away from each other, so. What could be shielded by one sector, for example, may be picked up by another a couple of blocks away. But yeah, I mean, buildings would attenuate the signal, block the signal, obstruct the signal. Those things are true. Okay. We can just have nothing further, thanks. Nothing further, Ron. Thank you. Please face the clerk and raise your right hand. Just tell me the story of your testimony will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth shall be God. Yes. Have a seat now. <coughs> May I, Your Honor? Me. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon. I'm just going to ask you to keep your voice up. Would you state your full name? Shakira Tabo. 
And could you spell your first name? S-H-A-Q-U-I-L-L-A. And your last name, please? T-H-I-B-O-U. And how old are you? I'm 21. And where do you live? 10 Faston Street. And how long have you lived there? 21 years. And um, who do you currently live there with? My mom. And uh, back uh, June of uh, 2013, who were you living with there at that time? My mom, my brother, my sister, and my niece. And you say your brother, uh, what is uh, his name? Odin Lloyd. And uh, your sister, what, was, uh, what is your sister's name? Olivia Taboo. How old, um, who was the eldest in, in, um, in your family? My brother. How, um, and how much older was he than you? Seven years. And how about your sister? She's six years older than me. Okay. Now, directing your attention back to Sunday, June 16th of 2013, do you recall on that date uh, seeing your brother? Yes. And when did you see him? Around 11 o'clock at night. And where did you see him? Outside my house. Where were you at around 11 o'clock on uh, June 16th, Sunday, June 16th, 2013? I was sitting on the porch with a friend. And at some point you said you saw your brother Odin? Yes. And where was he? In the yard. And when you say he was in the yard, where is the yard in relation to where you were sitting? To the right. How close is that? A couple of feet. And what was he doing in the yard? He was sitting in a car, in a truck, sorry. And when you say he was sitting in a truck, um, what kind of truck was that? A Suburban. Do you recall what color it was? Yes, black. And where exactly was the Suburban? Like um, in, in terms of, you said the, um, um, near your house, um, where, do you have a driveway there? Yes. Okay, and was the Suburban in the driveway? Yes. Can you tell us how that was parked in the driveway? Um, it was like backed in, so the front of it was facing the road. Okay. And when you said you saw your brother, um, how long did you see him um, around the Suburban or in the Suburban? Uh, the whole time I was outside. Well, for maybe an hour or two while I was on the porch at least. Okay. Now at some point, um, did you, did you have a, another friend who had come by to visit? Yes. Was that a male friend of yours? Yes. And how did he come by to visit? Uh, he came in his car. And when he came by his car, can you just describe uh, Faceton Street? Is that one way or two way? It's a one way. And how does the road um, uh, travel? Like from what direction? Um, which way does it go one way? Um, to the right. And when you say to the right, uh, how, how would you be oriented? that the travel would be going to the right? You know, let me, that was a, a poor question. If, if you're standing in front of your home, mm -hmm. 10 Faison Street, and you're looking at the house, from which direction does, um, um, does the one way go? If I'm looking towards the house, it's going to the left. Okay. Now, when you said uh, at some point in time, uh, your, a male friend of yours had come by in a car. Yes. And did, uh, did he park somewhere on the street? Yes. Where did he park? Diagonal to my house. And when you say diagonal to your house, at the time he pulled up and parked, were you still sitting on the steps? Yes. And when you say diagonal, which way, left or right? It would be to the left. Okay. And as a result of your friend parking diagonally to the left across the street, what did you do? I got up and I got in the car. Okay. And how long would you say you visited with your male friend uh, in the car? A few hours. Okay. And during this time, did you, st uh, did you still see your brother Odin at any time? Yes. And where were, what could you see him doing? Uh, he got out the car, and then he got back in the car, and then he left. And when you say he left, at some point in time, did you actually see him leave in the car? Yes. And do you know approximately how long he was gone for? Maybe an hour. And after an hour, did you see him return? Yes. When he returned, uh, was he, did he return in the car? Yes. And what did he do when he returned in the black suburban? Mm -hmm. He sat in the car for a few more minutes, and then he got out. Okay. When you say he sat in the car, at some point, did he park it? Yes. And where did he park it? In the same place in the driveway. And was that uh, face in or face out? Uh, face out. 
Now, during this time, how far would you say you were from where uh, he was, either in the car or the front of your home? Still a couple of feet. Now, I'd like to direct your attention to approximately 2.30 in the morning. Where were you at that time? Were you uh, still in the car? Yes. And where were you sitting in the car? Um, I was in the passenger seat. And so, if sitting in the passenger seat, what part of the roadway was closest to you? The street. Okay. And is there parking along both sides of Faceton Street? Yes. Were there, were there any cars along the other side of Faceton Street, um, uh, uh, essentially across from you? Yes. Now, at some time at approximately 2.30 in the morning, did you see your brother, Odin? Yes. And w uh, where was he at that time? He had gotten out the car. Okay. And when you said he had gotten out of the car, did you see him go, uh, did you see the general area that he was he was in? Yes. Where was that? Um, he walked next door to, to the house, next door to mine, to, on the left-hand side, and he threw something in the trash. Okay. When you say he threw something in the trash, do you know what he threw in the trash? Yes, it was a Red Bull can. I'm sorry, a? A Red Bull can. Okay. And after he threw the Red Bull can, um, and, and just for our orientation, where you're sitting, when he walked to the house next door, was that closer to your position of being across the street or farther away? Um, l let me ask you this. Yeah. Um, you, you've described where your home was, was uh, from sitting on your porch, uh, strike that, where you had initially been sitting on the porch, you went to the car, it was uh, diagonal to your left. Yes. But across the street. Yes. Now, the black suburban where you saw Odin sitting, if you were sitting on the steps, would be to what side? To the right. To the right. Now, at some point now that you're in this other position in the car, and you saw your brother Odin get out of the suburban, did he move in a, a direction toward the trash can closer to you or further away? Oh, closer to me. Okay. So when he moved in that direction, was... Was he still on the other side of the street? Yes. Are there sidewalks on both sides? Yes. And when, when he got to that trash can, just give us an idea of how close he was across the street from you. Directly across the street. Okay. And do you recall how he was dressed that evening? Yes. And how was he dressed? He had on jeans, a sweatshirt, a hat, and a button-up shirt. Okay. And after you saw him take this uh, Red Bull can and put it in the trash can, what did you see him do? Um, he walked, he stood there for a second, and then he walked back towards the driveway. Okay. And within, a, um, a, again, at approximately 2.30, within a few minutes of seeing him th uh, discard this can in the trash, did you see any traffic on the, uh, on the street? Yes. Okay. And from what direction did any traffic come? Um, it was coming, it's a one way, so it was coming the only way it could. Okay. So from your position, sitting in the passenger seat, that was the front passenger seat of your friend's car? Yes. Would it, uh, from what direction would it have approached you? From behind. Okay. Now at some point as this, um, um, did a, a car come by? Yes. And just tell us what you saw of that car. The car stopped in front of the driveway. And approximately how far was it when you said it stopped from where you were sitting? Um, a few feet. It was right in front, directly in front of the driveway. Okay. And when it went by, how close was the car when it passed your position in the front passenger seat? Maybe about a foot. Okay. And just describe the car that passed you and then uh, stopped. Um, the silver will look to me, to me like maybe a, a Nissan Maxima, something of that sort. Okay. And um, are you familiar with the Nissan Altima? Yes. Yeah, um, just with regard to its um, similarities, is it similar or dissimilar to an Altima? Um, it's similar. Okay. Now, what happened when the car, well, as this car went by, did you notice any damage to any part of that car? No. And after it went by you, what did it do? It stopped in front of the driveway. And when you say it stopped in front of the driveway, whose driveway was that? My driveway. And. When it stopped in front of your driveway, could you see your brother Odin at that time? Yes. And what did you see him, or where was he when the car stopped? Uh, he was closing the driveway gate. Okay. And did you see him go somewhere after he closed the driveway gate? Yes, he, had, he went towards to get in the car. Okay. Would you describe how you saw your brother, um, what did you see him do as he approached 
that car? He walked towards the car and he attempted to get into the passenger seat. When you say the passenger seat, which passenger seat? The front passenger seat. And did you see when he went to that location him do something? Yes. What did he, he do? He stopped as if there was a reason why he couldn't get into the passenger seat. And so after you saw him in that position, did you see him go somewhere else? Yes, he got into the back passenger seat. And when he got in the back passenger seat, did you see a, a, a door open? Yes. Do you know who opened it? He did. And when he opened it, did you see anything about the inside of the, um, of the car? Yes, um, the light came on, of course, and there was a shadow in the back driver's passenger seat. Okay. When you say there was a shadow, just describe the shadow that you could see in the back uh, um, seat. Just what looked to be like hair ahead. Okay. Did you see how many people were in the car as, as, uh, just before your brother was getting into the car? No. Okay. The, um, the, the shadow that you described, what part of the car was that? In the back driver's seat. Okay. Uh, and do you know, were you able to see a driver? No. Okay. Um, as a result of, uh, at that time, uh, did your brother get in the car? Yes. And after he got in the car, how long was the, that car stopped out in front of your home? Maybe about a minute. Okay. Now, after about a minute, uh, did you see where the car went? Yes. Where'd it go? It drove straight. And what happened as it drove straight, if you remember? Um, it just drove straight. I went back to my conversation. Okay. Now, when it went straight, just how far down is your home um, from uh, the next intersection? It's the fourth house down. Okay. And so what happens if you go four houses down? What do you run into? Uh, Blue Hill Ave. And Blue Hill Ave, um, can you, is that one way or two way? It's a two way. Can you go right, um, so right or left at that location? Yes. Now, if you go right, um, you'd be on Blue Hill Ave. Yes. What is located right on that corner on the right? A gas station. And if you go a block to, to the next time that you can uh, take a right turn, what, are you familiar with that area? Yes. What street is that? Quincy Street. Okay. And then if you go down, uh, if, if you travel down Quincy, can you ultimately then take a right and get back onto Faston Street? Yes. And what is the name of that street? Perth Street. Okay, so does that essentially comprise a city block? Yes. Okay. And this area, Faston Street, is that a, a residential, essentially homes or uh, apartment houses? Yes. Do you know uh, where number nine Faston Street is? Yes. And uh, where is that in relation to 10 Faston, your home? Diagonally to the right. Now, after, um, and, and you, do you know your neighbors in nine Faston? Yes. After you saw your brother get into this car and the car drive away, um, how long did you stay outside in, um, with your friend you know, sitting in the car? Maybe another 20, 30 minutes. Okay. And after 20, 30 minutes, what did you do? I went in the house. And when you say you went into the house, um, did you do something when you went back into your home? Yes. Um, while you were in the car, uh, let me ask you this. Did you have a, uh, a cell phone at the time? Yes. And did you have your cell phone on you when you were sitting out in the car? Yes. Did anything happen to your phone when you were out uh, in the car? Yes. What was that? My phone died. So at some point after your brother's now left and 20, 30 minutes later, you return to your home, do you do something with regard to your cell phone? Yes. And what is that? I plugged it into charge. And when you plugged it in um, to charge, just describe how you charge your phone. Um, I'm always on my phone. It's usually, um, the charge is always plugged in. So I just plug the part to go into the phone, into the phone. Okay. And when you plug, when your phone, uh, died and you plugged it back in, did it take uh, some number of minutes to charge? Maybe about a, a minute or two. I'm sorry? Maybe about a minute or two. Okay. And w after a minute or two, did something happen to your phone? Yes. And what was that? It vibrated. And did that mean something to you? Yes. And as a result of it vibrating, did you then um, go over and uh, look at your phone? Yes. And when you looked at the phone, uh, were you able to determine that you had um, received uh, two text messages? Yes. And uh, who were those text messages from? My brother. As to what? Telephone. I, I beg your pardon, Your Honor. As to what? Telephone. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Um, did you recognize, let me just ask you this, when you picked up your phone, is it uh, uh, fair to say that you had recognized your brother having had sent you, Odin, ha having sent you uh, two text messages? Yes. saying may ask her whether it recognized the number from which the text messages came. I beg your pardon, Your Honor. Ma'am, when, when, you, when you looked at your phone, was there a number that had sent a text to you, just yes or no? Yes. And did you recognize the number? Yes. And whose number was that? My brother's. Had you previously communicated him on, with, on that number, yes or no? Yes. Okay. And at the time after you charged your phone and you got this um, um, a vibration that there was missed messages, were there, just yes or no, were there two text messages at that time? Yes. Okay. And was the first, um, well, let me just ask you this. Do you remember your brother's phone number? Yes. And what is that? 617-785-3008. Okay. And your number, ma'am, at the time was what? 617-676-8341. Okay. Now, when you looked at your text message, uh, is it true that there was the first text message he had sent you, uh, uh, the number that you identified as your brother's, was at 3.07 a.m.? Yes. Okay. And then four minutes later at 3.11 a.m., he had sent you another text message. True? Yes. And you had missed both of those. Is that right? Yes. Now, in between or sometime after 3.11, is that when you had now recharged your battery? Yes. Did you then um, send your brother um, a text message at 3.19 a.m.? Yes. And three minutes after that at 3.22 a.m., he sent he, uh, a text message from the number that you uh, recognize your brother. A text came back to you, yes or no? Yes. And then a minute after that, another text at 3.23 a.m. came in from a number that you recognize as your brother Odin Lloyds. Yes. Okay. Now, after that, uh, after that text, um, uh, those text message exchange. Did at some point after that did you go to bed? Yes. And the next morning, uh, uh, at some point, did you? Um, or the next day, or strike that later that day, or right just uh, later in the morning, or um, did you see the black suburban in the driveway? Yes. And did you see your brother the next day? No. Okay. Now during the course of the day uh, into the night. Uh, did you continue to see the black suburban in the driveway? Yes. Did you ever see it moved? No. Okay. Did you ever see your brother during the course of that day? No. Did you ever have any more phone contact with him during the course of that day? No. Now, at some time that evening, um, did you receive a phone call? Yes. And, and who called you? I was a state trooper. Okay. Do you... Do you um, have you met an individual by the name of Trooper Eric Benson? Yes. Do you, do you know if he called you? Yes. Did you have a conversation with him, just yes or no? Yes. And as a result of that conversation, did you, um, did you do something with your phone? Yes. What did you do? I gave my phone to my mom. Okay. And did your mom, did, uh, uh, did, was your mom on the phone for some period of time? Yes. Approximately how long? I don't know, I left the room. After that, did, at some point, did somebody come to your home? Yes. Who was that? Police officers. And just yes or no, did you speak to the police officer? Yes. When you spoke to them, did you uh, do something with your phone? Just, uh, did you show somebody your phone? Yes. Now, did you, um, after that occasion, after the police had arrived at your home, did you learn your brother uh, Odin was, was dead? Yes. And after that time, um, did you, had you ever met an individual by the name of Aaron Hernandez? No. Did you ever see him or have any contact with him um, at your home or otherwise, phone, letter, after you learned about the death of your brother? No. Thank you.
Recognize this diagram? Yes. Okay, what do you recognize this to be? A uh, map of around my house. Okay. Do you see Faceton Street located on this map? Yes. Okay. Um, and the streets that I had asked you about, do you see those here? Yes. Okay. And, um, Your Honor, if I could. No Maybe mark this next exhibit. Yes. I'm just going to direct. Does that help you at all? That's fine. Okay. I'm just going to direct your attention over here. Do you recognize this as Faceton Street? Yes. And you indicated that if, um, you were the fourth house down? Yes. Uh, am I accurately pointing to your home here? Yes. Okay. And then you described uh, Blue Hill Avenue. Um, over here? Yes. And then Quincy Street, and then Perth Street, is that right? Yes. Well, and if you travel, are you familiar with it, uh, traveling up Blue Hill Avenue? Yes. Now, if you travel up Blue Hill Avenue over here, if you come down faced and travel up Blue Hill Avenue, where, where do you go? Where will that take you? Uh. Uh, uh, let me, I'm sorry, let me ask you this. Are you familiar with um, um, the Boston Medical Center? Yes. In, if you go up Blue Hill Avenue in that direction, do you travel towards that or away from that area? Towards it. Your with the court's permission, if I could play Exhibit 179, please. Me. Ma'am, I'm just going to have you direct your attention to the, um, to the screen to your left. Hmm? Okay. Ma'am, do, uh, do you recognize this scene? Yes. And what do you recognize it to be? The, my house in the street that I live on. And just directing your attention to the right side of the street now, there's a, the, the car that's the closest to us. Do you, um, do you see that car there? Yes. And then do you see a car behind it? Yes. Uh, do you know, do you recognize the car that you were in that night? Yes, the car behind it. Okay. And as you've indicated, um, do you see a van? Yes. On the other side of the street? And where is that in relation to your home? Directly in front of it. And your, the driveway that you described your brother Odin having uh, parked the Suburban, um, is that in front of the van or behind it? It's in front of it. Okay. Okay, if we could play this, please. Now, ma'am, I'm just going to have you direct your attention to see some lights from, uh, further down the street. Yes. Do you, uh, with regard to the area of um, Perth Street, um, if, if you came down Quincy and took a, a right to come back to Faceton Street, is that Perth? Yes. Okay. Just with regard to that location where you see, just uh, down the street, um, is that in the area of Perth Street? Yes.
And we just hold. You see the uh, a person on the far sidewalk there walking along. Yes. And who is that? My brother. Okay. And what was was that before or after what you described as uh, throwing the uh, the can in the trash? After. Now this vehicle that is uh, in the in the center of the street now. Do you recognize that vehicle? Yes. And and how um, how do you or what what vehicle was that? The brother that the car that my brother left in. Okay. And now you d uh, indicated in your testimony that you saw your brother walk toward the pass the uh, front passenger seat. Is that true? Yes. Is that shown in this um, video? Yes. <laughs> And again, at this time, was there anything about the car that appeared to be unusual in terms of any damage that you observed to it? No. got a late start today. We're going to finish up with this uh, witness unless some of any of you have a problem. Um, I don't believe it's uh, from what counsel tell me. I don't think we're going to go more than an additional 15 or 20 minutes. Thank you. You may proceed. Good afternoon, Ms. Thibault. Good afternoon. Um, I believe you testified on direct examination that you were on the porch of your home on Faston Street around 11 o'clock um, that Sunday night. Is that correct? Yes. And we're talking about Sunday night, June 16th. Yes. And you mentioned on direct examination that you were on the porch with a friend. Is that yes. right? Yes. Um, and then later, I think when Mr. McCauley asked some questions, mentioned that a, um, another friend came uh, and uh, pulled up in a car across the street. Is that right? Yes. Um, those weren't the same friends, were they? No. Um, the friend who pulled up in the car was uh, your boyfriend at the time, uh, Drew. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and you mentioned that you spent some time out there um, with, with Drew in his car. Is that right? Yes. Uh, and am I and I correct, Mr. Bowen, that you were out across the street from your house um, between the hours of one and three o'clock in the morning that Monday, uh, June seventeenth? 
Yes. Um, and it was from that position uh, that you viewed um, what you described on direct, for example, uh, the car coming and uh, your brother getting in the car. Yes. Um, now, the video you just saw, um, I believe it was Exhibit 179, um, uh, did that accurately depict what you saw from the vantage point of that car? Yes. Um, that video we saw was taken from the front. That wasn't your view, was it? No. Your view was from behind in the car you pointed out against the curb, is that right? Yes. Um, but the video, <laughs> as far as depicting your brother walking to the car and getting in the car and the car leaving, um, that, that is consistent with what you saw that night? Yes. Um, I think you mentioned also that your brother left for a time, is that right? Yes. Before the car came and picked him up, your brother was gone for about an hour? Yes. Um, and when he came back, uh, he had a uh, uh, can of Red Bull in his hand? Yes. And you saw that from your vantage point in uh, Drew's car? Yes. And you saw him throw the empty Red Bull away in the trash? Yes. Um, and, then, uh, and then shortly thereafter, uh, he was picked up uh, by the car we saw on the screen? Yes. Um, now, Mr. McCauley asked you, and I, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, the black Suburban um, that was in the driveway. Um, you saw your brother drive that Suburban that, that night and in the early morning hours of Monday. Uh, the photograph um, you took with your phone um, of your brother driving the black Suburban? Yes. And that was earlier that same weekend in June? Yes. Um, and does that uh, fairly and accurately depict uh, what you observed when you took the photograph? Yes. Your Honor, at offer, please. No objection. And we'll move to the next exhibit. Yes.
Um, Ms. Thibault, uh, the photograph that uh, we just saw, um, did you know where that uh, suburban had come from? That is, uh, where Odin had gotten it? Yes. Um, if you, uh, objection is uh, sustained, unless you physically saw him receiving it. No. Okay. I have nothing further at this time, Your Honor. Thank you. We will then suspend at this time, continue uh, tomorrow morning. Please continue to avoid anything about this case or Mr. Hernandez in a newspaper or television or radio or a magazine or any social uh, media. Uh, please continue to avoid speaking or emailing or texting or otherwise communicating in any fashion with anyone at all, including each other, about this case or Mr. Hernandez or anything you think could be relevant to the case. If anyone tries to talk to you, please end it immediately. And please do not do any research about the case, Mr. Hernandez, or anything you think could be relevant to the case. Have a good evening. We'll see you tomorrow morning. But all right. All persons having anything further to do before the Honorable, the Justice E. Susan Gosh of the Superior Court, now sitting at Four River within and for the Commonwealth, depart and give your attendance here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., to which time and place the sitting of this court is now adjourned. God save the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. tomorrow morning, so you will have to return tomorrow. Thank you. Uh, uh, which one of you is arguing the motion on uh, to preclude admission or display of a uh, Block 45? Uh, as the court knows, uh, the Commonwealth wants to display uh, either one or maybe it's more than one fully functional Glock 45 caliber semi-automatic pistols to the jury. Uh, page four of the memorandum filed today, Your Honor, uh, states uh, quite clearly that the display of the Glock 45 firearm is intended to, quote, assist the jury, close quote, in determining what object the defendant is holding in various photos from his surveillance video. According to the Commonwealth's memo at page two, uh, their uh, expert, Mr. Aspinwall, will opine that what is depicted in the surveillance video is, quote, consistent with a Glock pistol based on the size, color, uh, shape, and shape of the curve of the back strap, close quote. The Commonwealth describes what it wants to do, both in the heading of its filing and at pages 7 to 8, as a, quote, demonstration. In general, as the Court knows, uh, Your Honor, the Court has uh, discretion in this area, and there certainly are cases in which uh, the SJC has found no abuse of discretion where the Court allowed uh, the Commonwealth to use uh, an exemplar, uh, although I should point out that in one of the cases cited by the Commonwealth, Ellis, the SJC noted uh, that 377 Mass, uh, one at page seven, that, quote, there was no need for the gun to be an exhibit, close quote. The court's job, obviously, is to balance probative value versus unfairly prejudicial effect. However, Your Honor, none of these cases involve what this case does, which is an identification issue. That is, what is depicted in a grainy video, and that makes this case and this proposed demonstration very different from any of the cases cited by the Commonwealth. Your Honor, showing the jury a fully functional Glock 45 in that context is both unnecessarily and unreasonably suggestive. It's just like a show-up. Uh, it's They're not showing uh, the jury an array of other black handguns with curved back straps let alone other items. They're showing the jury a single item and essentially asking the jury to, to compare that item 
to this grainy video. That is just like a show up, and just like in the, in the show up cases that the SJC decided in December, uh, I think Collins and, and the other case that I think I cited, Your Honor, uh, it's either a violation of due process, or if it's not a constitutional violation, Your Honor, it's fundamentally unfair on the ID front. And the Commonwealth simply ignores that subject altogether. They simply do not address that in their memo at all. As for the other grounds cited by the Commonwealth as to why they say uh, they need this demonstration, Your Honor, their expert can testify about the color, the shape, uh, and the weight of uh, a Glock 45. They don't need to wave an actual gun around the courtroom with all of that, the, the, the inflammatory impact of that dramatic demonstration to get testimony as to the color, the shape, and the weight uh, of a Glock 45. Indeed, the specifications uh, of, of the firearm itself uh, of a fully loaded Glock 21 uh, is that it weighs 1,090 grams, 2 pounds, 6.48 ounces. Their expert can testify to that. They don't need the jury picking it up and weighing it to determine what it weighs. They can get that through testimony without this kind of a uh, uh, unnecessarily and highly and unfairly prejudicial demonstration. The bottom line, Your Honor, is this is a completely unnecessary and completely unfair stunt. It's unfairly suggestive, it's unfairly prejudicial, uh, and the court should not allow it. And the only, I want to make one other point, Your Honor. On page two of their memo, they refer to uh, uh, page two, yeah, page two. Um, they refer to an item recovered from. This is at the top of their of their uh, memo, page two. They refer to an item recovered from the Nissan Altima, being consistent with a magazine. Uh, Your Honor, there was no item recovered from the Nissan Altima consistent with a magazine, uh, and that uh, does not belong in a filing. Uh, in this court. I just want to bring that particular error to the court's attention. Thank you, Thank you Your Honor. Your Honor, if I could, I'll start with the error. It's not an error. In fact, it's captured on video uh, some number of hours after the homicide. The defendant is at the pool. He then leaves the pool. He goes, he's wet. He's actually in the pool. He leaves his child with Carlos Ortiz. He's dripping wet. He comes walking through the house from the basement up the stairs out into the driveway, he goes over into the front compartment of the car, he reaches in, he grabs what it appears to be a magazine, which the witness would say is consistent with a magazine. He described the item as a magazine, he just said it to you shape, it has a lip, he couldn't say it was a Glock magazine, but he definitely said it was a magazine. It may be the use of the word recovered sounded like it was recovered. Okay, I guess that's how I took it, Your Honor. If that's oh, not how it was meant, okay. I apologize. So, uh, oh, okay. I, I, I wish was the impression I got when I read that, too. From, but I'm sorry, so Your Honor, you then, then that's my mistake. You clarified that. 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 Um, I do have one question before hearing sure. the argument um, as to what the, um, the person from uh, Glock would testify uh, with respect uh, to the, is it a back strap? Yes, Your Honor. Is that a, is something unique to a Glock, or would he testify that that's yes, Your Honor. unique? Something unique. Yes, it, it is. And, and the back strap is where, uh, where you might hold the handle, it's that back curvature, and it's got like a, what they call a tang, which act, actually comes out in a certain shape, and he's able to identify it from that. First of all, I would just uh, respond, Your Honor, by saying there's no stunt involved, and, and this is not unusual. Your Honor will remember, I, th I believe, the last case we tried, um, Commonwealth versus Thomas Jeffries. We had a ballistician come in with a particular uh, firearm, uh, and it wasn't the murder weapon, but it was shown uh, to aid the jury in understanding and also for them to then understand other witnesses' testimony, which is exactly the case here. But it wasn't mocked. Or they're often not mocked as an exhibit, as in Ellis refers to uh, no need to mock it. Well, well, the only thing about versus, the marking, uh, I guess we wouldn't chalk. have, uh, yes, Your Honor, th this could be a chalk, and part of it is it's the defense, uh, the defendant himself cross-examined witnesses about the, um, the weight of it, um, and uh, whether it was a kilogram, and whether that be consistent with, 
with that, obviously the color, the shape, and the size is all relevant. They need to see these, uh, th these things. So this wouldn't be unusual. It's not a stunt. I, 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 uh, I, I guess I take exception to the suggestion that that's what this is all about. This is a routine matter, as Your Honor um, uh, well knows. And so I would uh, respectfully ask that this be permitted, even in a chalk form, that they be allowed to see this and the witness be able, uh, able to testify to it. Thank you. Thank you. The In the recent um, House right uh, case uh, that both of you uh, uh, cited, uh, the Supreme Judicial Court stated that uh, where, for whatever reasons, I, uh, original items of physical evidence cannot be produced, uh, substitutes similar to the originals have often been received as exhibits in criminal and civil trials to illustrate and corroborate testimony in which the originals figured. Uh, the omission of such exemplars uh, is well understood to rest in the discretion of the court. Uh, the language in that case uh, reflects uh, settled law that in no way limits uh, the Commonwealth to use a photograph as opposed to the actual, uh, uh, as opposed to using an actual weapon as an exemplar. Um, numerous um, Massachusetts cases, several uh, cited by the Commonwealth, have held it proper for the Commonwealth uh, to use an exemplar gun specifically as an exhibit. Um, in the um, Ellis case, um, um, the uh, court uh, pointed out that the uh, use of such a weapon, um, uh, uh, which is similar but not identical uh, to the alleged murder weapon, is not an abuse of discretion as long as it is clear through the questions elicited uh, <coughs> or through limiting instructions by the court uh, that the model is not alleged to be the actual murder weapon uh, but simply um, illustrative. Uh, the, uh, uh, in Ellis, the court did go on uh, to note that there was no need for the model to be an exhibit um, which actually goes into the jury room as opposed to an exhibit for identification, a chalk uh, used uh, during a testimony and displayed uh, to the uh, jury. Um, and that was a case uh, that involved, among other things, uh, uh, the weapon being relevant because of its uh, weight. Uh, the uh, and, uh, Florentino case, the court um, also held that it was proper to admit a gun similar but not identical to the gun used in um, uh, the murder where the judge gave uh, clear limiting instructions that it was not the actual uh, murder weapon. Um, the uh, uh, and there are several other cases as well, Lunar and Sousa. Uh, here, um, uh, I don't uh, see this as the kind of show-up identification that was discussed in the uh, Jacket case. Uh, the witness who is uh, familiar with Glocks, who, who is a, a Glock employee, uh, would be uh, testifying uh, that uh, the uh, unique design of the Glock back strap um, uh, matches or t t that he concludes that, that the object um, uh, is uh, a Glock um, because of uh, the design that he, that, that, that he sees uh, on the film. He can point out the shape or, or angle of the back strap and then say that that is the shape and angle of some model Glock 45s and that um, and uh, uh, that's relevant uh, given the testimony that has already uh, come out that the uh, uh, ballistics testimony to the extent uh, that it's come out uh, that uh, it is the opinion of the ballisticians uh, that the murder weapon was a Glock uh, 45. Uh, uh, the seeing the color and the size of it uh, is also relevant to the testimony of the housekeepers that were was admitted um, uh, for the as to whether the defendant had the means uh, to uh, commit the uh, crime charged or to supply others with the means um, and uh, the likelihood 
um, or non-likelihood of uh, what they saw being uh, a Glock. Um, I think that it is the kind of thing that makes uh, would is best would would that it is not unduly prejudicial and would make sense for the jury to be able to see an actual uh, weapon as opposed to simply uh, a, a photograph. Uh, the uh, peculiar back strap uh, is certainly relevant, and I think one can get a feel for that better uh, by seeing the actual weapon, uh, in actual weapon, as opposed uh, to simply a photograph. Um, the court finds the use of an exemplar to be relevant, more probative than prejudicial. Um, in the exercise of the court's discretion, uh, the uh, defendant's motion uh, to preclude any use of a uh, exemplar weapon is denied uh, and may be marked as an exhibit for identification uh, when the uh, witness testifies and uh, shown to the jury and the witness can display what he says are unique uh, aspects of, of uh, Glock 45s or other Glocks um, and the court will give an instruction uh, to the effect that there is um, and I assume there will be questions that will also make it clear that this is not the firearm in question. The court will also give instructions that, that this is not the firearm in question, that it's admitted uh, uh, or that it's being used as a chalk for a limited purpose uh, um, to uh, let the jury consider its physical uh, attributes in assessing other trial uh, evidence and um, that there is absolutely no claim that this is the actual gun that may have been used to shoot Mr. Lloyd. Well, Your Honor, if it's being, if it's being used uh, essentially to illustrate the witness's testimony, I ask that the Commonwealth not be allowed to pass it among the jurors. So I ask the court to, to limit its use to they can display it. Um, uh, if the court, uh, this is what the court's ruling, which I obviously object to. Mr. Asserwal can explain. They can put it on the screen. But it should not be passed among the jurors in the jury box. Your Honor, I, I would respectfully uh, respond that it was the defendant um, I think Mr. Fee, who questioned the witness about the weight of, of it, and actually put a weight on it. Clearly, like anything else, any other exhibit, they would have the ability then to assess it um, using their own senses. And in, this case, and in this case, holding it and judging for themselves whether the weight she described, one kilogram, um, was consistent with the item they're holding, which is 2.2 pounds, 2.3 pounds, that I think the court took judicial notice of that. They put that part into the case. They would have to handle this firearm to understand the weight and whether that would be consistent with the witness's testimony and whether they could find, based on that, that what they observed was, in fact, consistent with the item that, uh, that they would be uh, holding. I think consistent with Ellis uh, stating that there's no need for it to go to the jury room, um, that I would not allow you to pass it back and forth. I would allow the witness to come down off the witness stand and stand right in front of the jury because I think it's important that they be able to see the exact angle and shape of the back strap and certainly uh, he can testify um, as a, a, a Glock employee as to the weight of that weapon or other Glock 45s. Thank um, you. Uh, uh, thank you. See you tomorrow morning. Thank you. All right.